Welcome to the St. Benedict's Episcopal School Podcast. Planting seeds, cultivating critical thinking, creativity, community, and lifelong learning. Here we'll take you on a transformative journey into the inner workings of this unique school and the people behind it. So sit up straight, school's in. And here's your host and head of school, Father Brian Sullivan. Hello there, folks, and welcome back to Planting Seeds, Cultivating Critical Thinking, Creativity, Community, and Lifelong Learning. I'm your host, Father Brian Sullivan, and today we've got a real treat for you. We're sitting down with someone who brings a whole lot of heart, soul, that's a hint, and a dash of fun to St. Benedict's Episcopal School. Our guest today is a true rock star in her own right. She is not only the school's chaplain, uh, there's the soul, <laughs> but also a remarkable individual with a wealth of experience in the world of faith, education, and interfaith dialogue. She's been a guiding light at St. Benedict's for quite some time, and she brings a unique blend of spirituality, warmth, and a deep commitment to nurturing the minds and hearts of our school's children. Not only does she serve as a spiritual guide for St. Benedict's community, but she is also a proud mom, an advocate for diversity and belonging in religious education, and she even has a fascinating array of pets. <laughs> <laughs> that you'll want to hear about. We're excited to learn more about her journey, the school's unique approach to faith, and the heartwarming stories that make St. Benedict's so special. Without further ado, I'm thrilled to introduce our guest today, the beloved chaplain of St. Benedict's Episcopal School, the Reverend Wendy Porter Cade. Welcome, Wendy. Hello. That was a lot. I appreciate <laughs> it. Thank you. You are affectionately known to us as chaplain or not even chaplain, just CPC, which just stands for Chaplain Porter Cade. So as we interchange Wendy with CPC, I think if our students are listening, they won't even know who Wendy is. <laughs> <laughs> so you had a, a rich background as an Episcopal priest before even becoming a school chaplain, but you've been here for 15 years. No, I've been a chaplain for 15 years. I've been uh -huh. here yeah, that, for nine years. <laughs> still, I'm sure it felt like 15 at some times. Some days, yeah. <laughs> so how did that begin uh, here at St. Benedict's? Well, well, there are lots of different ways I could tell this story. I'll go way back, but I'll try to keep it short. When I was in seminary a very long time ago, I always knew in my heart that working as a parish priest in a church was not for me long term. And so when I became ordained and I was working in parishes in Delaware and then back in Atlanta, I always sort of had my ear to the ground of the school world. And at some point, a position opened up at Holy Innocence just down the road in Sandy Springs. And I just gobbled it up. I was the middle school chaplain there for a few years. And then in the same way that a position sort of magically opened up at Holy Innocence, a position magically opened up here at St. Benedict's. I interviewed for the job the day my son was due to be born. I was very pregnant and I accepted the job while I was in the hospital recovering from his birth. So that was nine years ago in March. And I've been here ever since. It's my dream job in lots of ways. It keeps me on my toes and keeps me busy. And it's great. I can't remember that story completely, but I don't think I pressured you while you were in the hospital. Didn't you want to know? Oh, I'm, I as think soon as I possible. pressured y'all. I pressured y'all. <laughs> I really wanted it. <laughs> you know, bosses are bosses, right? <laughs> <laughs> well, here at St. Benedict's Episcopal School, you've placed a strong emphasis on Episcopal faith in our tradition as an Episcopal school is a little bit different than like a church faith. Could you explain a little bit about how our tradition as Episcopal priests and our tradition in the Episcopal church is a little bit different in our school's daily life and in education? Sure. So, you know, everything that I do as a priest is from a Judeo-Christian point of view, and I can't change that. It's who I am to my core, and it's who this place is also. But when it comes to Episcopal education, the thing the Episcopal Church does really well is it makes way for people of all faiths to come together, to belong truly in equity, and to learn and to practice faith and pray together in a way that is truly diverse and truly inclusive. We don't just preach it, we practice it. So, I mean, you know, the Book of Common Prayer is a beautiful book, but full of Jesus language, and it's obviously very Christian. But the thing it does is the prayers lend themselves to 
be prayed without much tweaking of the language by anyone who serves one God. And we recognize that no matter who you are or where you are on your journey, everybody has their own sort of path. Everybody has their own route. And the Episcopal Church embraces the diversity of those paths and the way they sort of converge in some places and then diverge in other places. And we celebrate the journey instead of trying to make it all uniform and the same, if that makes sense. It does. Yeah. And I'm very excited to hear that a lot of uh, some of, we've got some listeners in Canada and the UK, even the Dominican Republic and uh, down on the yeah. islands. Episcopal is part of the Anglican Church. So those of you listening in that that tradition that, that we bring sort of started with two very different churches coming together in the, the late 1600s. Um, <laughs> And the Anglican Church found a middle way. And a lot of people think that's sort of watering it down. But in a lot of ways, it makes us a lot stronger to be able to include what we do here, which is diversity and belonging in our religious education. And it's really close to our heart. I know it's close to yours. How do you take these principles and manifest them in the students' experiences in your classes? I know you have got a unique way of teaching our kids and all their different backgrounds. Well, I'll tell my age old Abraham Ibrahim story. So years ago, I was in a second grade classroom and I was teaching from Genesis. We were really beginning the the story of God's covenant with Abraham and where you know God appears as a voice to Abraham and says, you will be the father of many nations. And the way I always begin the, the lesson is this is the story of how our family began and we're talking about Abraham and Sarah, how their names were Abram and Sarai. And I've got a big tree drawn on the board and we're talking about family. And one boy, I'll never forget him, raises his hand and he says, in my holy book, we have, this sounds like a story from my holy book, but his name isn't Abraham, it's Ibrahim. And I invite him to say more. And, you know, it comes to pass that he's a Muslim child and he's talking about the Quran. And I it's the sort of story that I can't script or even predict is going to happen. I simply turned it over to him, like, well, tell us more. And next thing I knew, he was the teacher. I mean, I was learning more about Islam in that little snapshot of a moment than I had in you know, my whole life. And then I said, well, you know, but those Abraham and Ibrahim, that's the same guy. We're talking about the same very important figure. We just read him from like slightly different angles in our own perspective faiths. And for that second grade class, for that whole unit, which is about four weeks long, it became a real lesson in interfaith dialogue between me, you know, a 42 year old Christian priest and this little boy, a seven year old who prays seven times a day in his own way, in his own language, from his own book. And the way we were able to weave our own stories was really magical. And I I hope, I mean, you know, who knows if he even remembers that. That was years ago, but it stuck with me. And it has now informed the way I teach that story every year to second graders. So that's just an example. It's a good one. Our paths have uh, overlapped in weird, strange, holy <laughs> ways. We've worked at the same churches. I went to Holy Innocence where you were a chaplain. But we also did work uh, in the Middle East separate times, but with the same program called Kids for Peace, where we brought children from the Jewish, Christian and Muslim traditions together, both Israeli and Palestinian. And I'm curious, you and I haven't talked about this yet, how the last few weeks were in the midst of uh, probably one of the third largest, maybe even the largest Israeli Hamas conflicts. We're, literally, we're right in the middle of it. And we have Jewish families here. We have Muslim families. You just described a very good example of how we support all different traditions, but um, particularly in the in the midst of this conflict, how have you used the experiences we had in the Middle East to inform and support our families, both Jewish and Muslim? I would say that I haven't had a lot of like face to face moments with families over the course of the past few weeks, but it's in the air 
Father O, the other chaplain and I have been working in prayers for peace in the middle school chapel. We've been able to pray more explicitly. One of the unique challenges of being a lower school chaplain is striking that balance between being kid appropriate and honoring what's happening in the world. So what I'll say is that I've been extra mindful and in my conversations, particularly with the third and fourth grade, where we do a lot of SEL lessons, social emotional learning lessons um, in the context of my teaching, you know, it's it feels like a very generic idea of what it means to be people who make peace. But if you widen the shot, you know, generic peacemaking conversations with third graders in the midst of the world being torn apart and frankly, scary and feeling like it's heading toward any other path than peace has been an, an interesting challenge for me as both a chaplain and a teacher, but it's one that I take seriously. And so not long ago with a class of fourth graders and, you know, we're working on the words we say to each other. The book of Genesis reminds us over and over again, seven times, in fact, that everything God created is good and what that means because they always want to push back and they want why can't it be great why can't it be great so we talk about the word good in particular and how it means not just like you know a b plus is good no it means you've been created out of a place of infinite deep goodness and that infinite deep goodness can only come from god so in the context of that talking about how we're all created good that immediately provokes some interesting questions among students, right? Like, if we're all good, then why do those people do bad things? So constantly remembering that we're all created in God's image, no matter who we are, no matter where we come from, and that we've all been given, as I say in my preschool chapel, brains to think and hearts to love. And sometimes, sometimes we miss the mark and how we can all of us still be inherently good and messed up and reconciling those things and, and initiating conversations among fourth graders. They're not, I mean, they're nine, they're still children, right? So initiating these conversations with nine-year-olds and eight-year-olds and seven-year-olds, encouraging them to speak to one another as though because they are speaking into the face of God, that is the hard work of peace. And so I don't have to be explicitly teaching about the conflict in Gaza in order to be teaching these children that, or showing these children, because they, they already know it, but showing them that they can be agents for change and that they can be people who make peace in a broken world. And it has to start when they're very little. So that's a very long way of answering that I haven't explicitly addressed the conflict in the Middle East in my classes with very small children. But if you just take a few steps back, it's not a far stretch. Yeah. And we've had some some incredible things in the world happen while our students are here. And mm -hmm. you're a big proponent of uh, one of my favorite quotes is uh, preach the gospel always. And if necessary, use words, Use words. Yeah. Which means, you know, show it instead of necessarily saying it. But you do love to preach. I know that for a fact. Um, it's central to part of your work as a chaplain with four worship services all week, each grade getting one chance to worship a week, but you are in front of a lot of different children. How do you preach the gospel, God's love to all of our children with such an array of ages? Mm -hmm. When I preach to adults, I find that preaching to them as though they're still small thinkers is just as effective. I actually prefer to preach to children. I think that uh, little ones have they're, you know, they're closer to the truth than we are in many ways. They're closer to the heart of God because of just by virtue of how far away they are from their own birth, right? The older we get, the harder it is, I think, for us to remember that we were created in God's image. And I actually think it's easier. So, and when it comes to like the, like scaffolding, to use a education word, from preschoolers to 14 year olds, you know, eighth graders, 
you know, God's love is God's love, no matter how you how you slice it. And I mean, going back to what you were saying about how sometimes people feel that the middle way is diluting it. I don't think that you can dilute it. You know, I mean, I can stand in front of a room full of four year olds and say, is God's love small like an ant or big like a dinosaur? And they all scream, dinosaur. <laughs> I can take that exact seemingly kind of silly image and take it to a room full of 40 something people, humans, <laughs> grownups, and they're like, well, gosh, is it, can it be that simple? I'm like, yes, it can. It can be that simple that God loves us all the time, no matter what, in a big way. It can be that simple. Does that make it easier? No. Does it make it like less than in any way? Absolutely not. The gospel is the good news for a reason. And so just telling the truth in simple ways is a really easy, it comes easier to me than, I mean, there's a reason I'm not a philosophy professor, Ryan, right? <laughs> like, so I don't know if that answers your question, but yeah, I no, just, that's, that's perfect. I mean, that's, I, mean, uh, I think part of the reason people love working with children, no. it's, it's simple. And at the same time, we're helping them deepen them their faith at the same time there's a lot of the social emotional pieces that go into just working in an education and i'm, I'm wondering and how have you seen in your evolution as a priest in a parish and then into becoming a chaplain and in an education setting how do you bring that spiritual growth out without a set curriculum to do it with so you know this the board and leadership in the not too far past really sealed the deal on like our top five pillars, our top five virtues, belonging, integrity, grace, kindness, and respect. And if you take those five things, belonging, integrity, grace, kindness, and respect, that is the foundation of any good social emotional curriculum, if you ask me. It's also the foundation of any good Episcopal religious curriculum. So suddenly that Venn diagram looks a lot more like one circle instead of two, if you start looking at it that way. And so I can take, and this isn't for people who study the Bible and who are religious educators, what I'm about to say is not rocket science. I think you can take just about, just about <laughs> any story from the Bible. And if you look at it through the lens of those virtues, you can extract a social emotional lesson. You can take the whole, let's go with Mary and Joseph, right? So a story that most people know, right? An angel appears to Mary, tells her you're gonna have a baby. She goes through a range of emotions. Can you imagine? She goes through fear. She goes through a lot of questioning, maybe some anger, I know I would. She goes through like a, an honor, right? She's feeling ultimately loved by this God who is trusting her with this most important thing, which is carrying around a savior in her own body. <laughs> and then she has to tell her fiance, Joseph, this really weird hard news. So in that snapshot from the gospel of Luke, it's not very long. We can take that story, the story of the Annunciation, from the time Gabriel tells Mary that she's going to give birth to God's son. And then how she tells Joseph, you can take that little pricope and extract from it feelings, so many feelings. I can read the story to a group of children. I can have them illustrate it. We can talk through it. Just taking the person of Mary, we can start to see ourselves in these holy figures and in the ways that they're flawed, in the ways that they are blessed, in the way that they're touched by God's grace, and we can see ourselves in them. She's just one of my favorites because, you know, can you imagine that day for her when an angel appeared? And ask a first grader, not necessarily weeks after I teach that story because they're first graders, but maybe the day after, how are you like Mary? And like, well, when I get big news, I get really nervous. Like, oh yeah. Sometimes just learning how to name our our feelings doesn't come inherently to everybody. And so I get to sort of teach children how to do that and to teach them that all feelings are okay. And it's okay to feel sad and scared. And at St. Benedict's, thanks be to God, you are surrounded by grown-ups who are ready to who help you 
work through those big feelings and come out the other side having learned from them as opposed to being scared of them. Great segue into the fact that you don't just wear the hat of a chaplain. Um, you also wear the hat of a, a parent. Mm -hmm. um, Thomas, as you mentioned, was just born when you accepted this position. <laughs> and it's hard to believe he's a third grader now. What has that journey been like uh, sort of wearing both hats more as a parent watching him grow into this? Uh, I mean, he's he's becoming a, a little man. <laughs> don't tell him that. Um, <laughs> he you know first of all it is hard i mean being a parent is not for the faint of heart and i will just say that working where your child is comes with so many blessings and it's something i do not take for granted that i can pop in and see him eating lunch on a tuesday is special and it fills my heart and i love that i work at a place that i trust enough to be my kid's school, right? Which frankly, I think says a lot for St. Benedict's. I think it says a lot that, you know, you can't throw a piece of popcorn in this place without hitting the parent, without hitting a faculty member who is a parent of a child at the school. <laughs> yeah, don't throw popcorn at parents. Don't throw popcorn <laughs> <laughs> I was gonna say rock, but I just had to go with popcorn. Um, but he, the, the essence of what I'm saying though, you know, there is a community within the community of people who choose to work here and send their children to school here. And we learn from each other as parents and as colleagues, and it's a gift. So that's one part of it. The other part of being the facto counselor of the school and having a child who's here is I get a different dimension of what it means to be a first grader, second grader, third grader, and like the the actual struggles that they go through. I hear about it, you know, on my 15 to 17 minute commute home every day when all I say is, Thomas, give me an up or a down. And he's able to give me a window into not just his life, but into the life of all of the third graders. And it's a, again, going back to it being a gift. It's not just a gift to me, a mom, but me, a, me as the counselor at the school, to have his insight. Now, I'm not gonna tell him, of course, that he is providing me with you know, insight into my job. Don't want his head to get too big, but he's kind of my helper in more ways than one. And it's a joy, I love it. <laughs> yeah, I know he uh, it, it tends to be a theme in your sermons as well as your various and sundry pets and family members. <laughs> So as we uh, come to a conclusion, I, I think, you know, being in chapel is probably one of the biggest parts of your job, at least uh, as I look at the smile on your face, <laughs> is probably brings you the most joy. You want to talk a little bit about what that experience is like and having parents in there and everything else that goes along with planning? Yes. So chapel is a big part of my job and the bigger the school gets, the bigger chapel gets. When I started here, St. Benedict's had just gone from having one chapel for the whole school to having two chapels split between like slightly older kids and then the younger kids. And then something happened and we needed to have three chapels. We needed to have preschool and kindergarten and then first, second and third and then fifth through eighth. And then something happened and by something, I mean growth, we got even bigger. And post pandemic, here we are four chapels a week and some of it is space, but also necessity. What we have found is that, going back to your earlier question about preaching across the grade levels, bringing them together into age-appropriate groups has lent for an increase in student participation in chapel. Remember when we decided to, to make fourth and fifth grade their own chapel? It's so rich because these fourth graders who are trying so hard to be a little bit older are in there with just one group of older students. And then these fifth graders that we all want to pull back a little bit into their younger elementary school years, they're now given permission to not have to live up to being a middle schooler. They can kind of live back down into their childhood a little bit more. So four chapels a week is a lot, yes. And it is the one time without a doubt it happens all the time all over the school don't get me wrong in classrooms on the playground in specials classes but every week for sure four times a week 
those five pillars, integrity, grace, inclusion, belonging, all of that comes together four times a week in one room and the community is welcome to come and not just bear witness to the convergence of our Episcopal values, but they get to participate in it. And I think it's unique to us. I mean, sure, you can go to an Episcopal school and attend their chapel. What you're not going to see are parents lining up down the sidewalk to attend. It's an opportunity for families who may not go to church on a Sunday morning for whatever reason. It could be as basic as they have soccer practice, or it could be more profound, like for whatever reason, the church has not resonated with them. But they can come to chapel on Tuesday, Wednesday, or Thursday, sit with their children, watch their children pray, their children can watch them pray, and it just adds something to this community that I can't even quite put into words. It is so rich and it's so deep and it can't be taught and it can't be manufactured. It just is who we are. I always encourage prospective parents to figure out a way to come someday and just stand in the back or in the transept to the side and just watch how our student body comes together every week. It's really special and I am you know, gobsmacked by the fact that I get to lead it, you know, like, how did that happen by the grace of God? So thank you for asking. Yeah, that's great. I mean, that's one of the reasons that our uh, admissions coffees have actually overlapped with chapel. So parents can come and, and visit anytime they want. Uh, so you listeners, uh, as this episode comes to an end, you're welcome to come join us sometime. Call ahead of time, of course, and <laughs> RSVP your spot. Um, and I hope this podcast has helped you learn a little bit more about our exceptional and inspiring chaplain, the Reverend Wendy Porter Cade. But I hope it's also given you more knowledge on the intersection between the Christian faith, our Episcopal identity, and our diverse and welcoming community here at St. Benedict's. Until next time, keep spreading kindness, compassion, and love. Thanks for listening to Planting Seeds, cultivating critical thinking, creativity, community, and lifelong learning with your host, Father Brian Sullivan. To find out more about St. Benedict's Episcopal School, visit stbs.org. This podcast is a production of BG Ad Group, all rights reserved.